<laughs> Hi, Ann. How are you? I'm you very are, well, thank you. You are back home from Sugarland, Texas. I can see that. Did the critters, did uh, Charlotte and Emily miss you while you were gone? Yes. Uh, Emily decided to use some pillows as a cat box while I was gone. So, mm. Mm. <laughs> so that was a great, great start <laughs> to being back home. But and, everything's and, okay now. Did she wait until you came home to do that? Or was that no, waiting no, was for was... you when you arrived? Yeah, so, okay. because... Um, well, I mean, Brennan's cats were here too for a couple of days and then she wasn't getting her anti-anxiety medication. So, you know, it was kind of one of those things. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I know, I know how cats can be. They can sometimes be very uh, aggressive by communicating through their litter box. Yeah. Uh, it can and be a her, very aggressive thing. Yeah. And she, like I said, she, it's, it's an anxiety thing. She's on Fluxetine, which is pros, which is a generic for Prozac. Jeez. <laughs> Yes, I know. Tizzy's had her share of things as well. She does the gabapentin once in a while. Now she gets a monthly, like, pain shot for her her horrible arthritis. Yeah. But um, but she's she's doing fine. I'm sure this is what our audience uh, tuned in to, to hear about. So uh, anyway, I'm just going to preface our question okay. tonight by by commenting that today was one of those days, uh, and it was. I mean. I am in a lot of pain right now. I have a really severe neck ache uh, from a lot of the anxiety that happened today. And it was it's it's good stuff and negative stuff. It's just it just came in waves today. So this is like a little mini vacation to sit here and, and see your face and the cats and to answer some questions from from those good folks who uh, continue to show up for Ask Eddie and Ann. Uh, so let, let's do it. Let's let's dive right in. I'm gonna let you get it rolling. Okay, this is from Philip. Do you have a North City Festival coming to Texas or close to Texas this year or next? Uh, nothing planned as of the moment. And I'm gonna say, I'm gonna stop hedging my bets in that regard and say that no, in 2024, that won't happen. Um, I don't know what the closest one would be, probably Chicago. Um, but we we pretty much have a full schedule of Noir City festivals for this year. I don't personally think I could do any more uh, because we do have, you know, um, I don't know when this will be uh, posted on the internet, but I'm, I'm going to assume that the Noir City Festival in Oakland will have already started when this nope. goes up. It, nope. okay. This is posted on the 18th, so it will be starting tomorrow. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, the festival, the first festival of 2024 kicks off, and then we, uh, I mean, people can find this on the Noir City website, but, you know, Seattle and then uh, Los Angeles, where we will, despite some rumors to the contrary, we will be back at the Egyptian Theater on Hollywood Boulevard. And then, uh, you know, after that, we've got... Uh, I, oh, hell, I can't remember Boston and and uh, uh, Chicago and, and uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Philadelphia, Detroit, yeah. uh, Washington D.C. There's there's a lot in Paris in June, which is a big one that you know. Um, I, I don't want to make it sound like it's a strain to go to Paris, but it, <laughs> you know, it's a lot of traveling, and yeah. so I, I don't. I'm not really inclined to add too many more festivals this year and who who knows what the future holds it may be uh, something where there is so much interest that it may be like we have to start rotating you know so so that like we're doing some of these festivals every other year and then different cities on the off year you know if you follow what i'm saying so we'll see though we haven't we haven't come to that yet but um the dance card is pretty darn full. So, Philip, I hope you can make it to one of the existing festivals because it doesn't look like we're going to be back in Texas anytime soon. And just a reminder, um, so if you go to northcity.com, the list of all the announced uh, dates are on there. So you can see which city we're going to be in, the venue, and the dates. And then that gets added to as things get confirmed. Correct. And, in fact, uh, like – 
one hour ago, I confirmed dates for Noir City in Detroit. So that will be uh, like the third week of September. I think it's September. I, I don't want to, don't hold me to it, but it's like the 20, 22nd to the 24th, I think, are the dates. Whatever that Friday to Sunday is, that's very close to those dates. That's, that's Detroit. And so that was the, that was the last one to be finalized for this, for this year. So I don't, I don't think there's going to be any more besides what you will find on the website um, a, in addition to Detroit. Okay. okay. Um, our friend Martin, a noir addict from the Netherlands, uh, asks if there are any other South American countries besides Argentina that have produced good or great noir movies. Um, and he, he talks a little bit about our the work we've done with Flickr Alley, uh, releasing those Argentine films on Blu-ray. Uh, and he says, is there a specific reason for Argentina being the, the root of most of these, or can we expect to see great noirs, say, from Chile, Brazil, et cetera? Um, well, uh, Martin, the, the reason for that is because Argentina was the film capital of South America. If if you think of South America like North America, Buenos Aires was the Hollywood of South America. So uh, it stands to reason that more films would have been produced there. And if if there was talent in Brazil or or Uruguay or Chile or someplace like that, they invariably would gravitate to Buenos Aires. That's where they would go to to make it in the industry. So there are obviously other films from other countries, Brazil primarily. Uh, it, the, the issue is less the making of those films than the preservation of the films. That, that's the tough part. Like I have heard for years, uh, I have yet to, to have the opportunity to witness this myself, but I have heard for years that Uruguay is a gold mine because while they didn't have a big film industry there, they did have a really great film archive. But I have also heard from people from Uruguay that it was not well maintained. So, uh, in fact, this is going to, I'm embarrassed to say, I'm, I'm going to stump myself on this. There was a film that came out. I'm going to say six or seven years ago uh, from Uruguay about a guy who worked in the film archive there. It was a fictional film. It was a like a dramatic narrative film, but it was actually set in the archive there. And, and somebody from Uruguay came to San Francisco. It was, I think it was shown at the film festival. And I, I asked about that and he, he just kind of shook his head and said, it's in such disarray that, you you probably wouldn't have any luck going there to look for films, which is really sad. And and this is a this is a genuine issue, you know. Like this this year's Noir City Festival, all of them will will feature international films, and I wish it was easier to negotiate that to to find these films because there are certainly films that I know of because. Like a lot of people, you you find them now on the internet, on YouTube or something, and it's like, wow, this is great. Where do we get a good print of this? Or you know, and it's not easy. It really isn't easy. And there are a few. One in particular from Brazil. There's a terrific uh, uh, heist movie, like a a, a very uh, powerful uh, picture called Assault on the Pay Train, that is just very hard. I mean, you can get it on a DVD or something and it is on the internet, but good luck trying to find a 35 millimeter print of it or even locating the source of a DCP. It's, it's difficult. So I, I was unable to book that for the festival, maybe later in the year, if, you know, we don't stop doing the digging. Uh, so maybe later in the year, if we find it, it'll appear at one of the festivals along the way, but Anyway, that that's that's where that's at, Martin. I mean, uh, Argentina was was the mecca in South America, and that's where most of the films came from. If if the talent came 
from other places in South America, they ended up going to Argentina to make the films. This is Ron from Jupiter, Florida. I recently watched a film in Criterion's British Noir series, Yield to the Night. It had a Norish backstory told in flashbacks, but the movie is notable for the amazing portrayal by Diana Doors of a woman in prison awaiting her execution. And it, and it has a fine, uncredited performance by an adorable cat. I know you don't consider rightly that another film in the series, The Small Back Room, was Nor. You can say that about a couple other films in that series, but how about Yield to the Night? I love Yield to the Night. It's great. Have you seen it? Oh. Uh -huh. It's... Uh, but yeah. I love Diana Doors. She's she's fantastic in it. It's it's her best movie by far, you know. Yeah. And well, I shouldn't say by far. She actually made a few good films. Uh, but yes, it was, and she loved that film because that's when she escaped the the blonde bombshell thing. You know, she she had the Marilyn curse, like nobody yeah. took her seriously as an actor. And then she made that film, and it was great. And it, it's a really really interesting film and i i'm hoping that i can show it on tcm this year and it, it, to me it's interesting for several reasons number one is um people think it's based on the story of ruth ellis who was the last woman hanged well. in in england uh for murder and it's not. It's actually not based on that story. It's just complete coincidence that the Ruth Ellis case transpired right about the time that this film was being made. But the story was written before anybody knew who Ruth Ellis was. And it what makes that really interesting is uh, it's the book was written by a woman named Joan Henry. I think that was her name, Joan Henry. And she had done time in prison so she she was kind of basing a lot of the stuff in the story all the all the really wonderful details there's a um there's a lot of similarities to i want to live the susan mm -hmm. hayward picture um and joan henry did a really great job of getting all of those little details of of prison life and waiting for your day of execution and everything she got all that stuff down um, really, really well. And it's intriguing because uh, Joan Henry also co-wrote the screenplay for the movie and she was married. She married J. Lee Thompson, who directed that film. And to me, all, all of that is, is really fascinating. Yeah. And, and the movie has a brilliant opening scene and it's really, really noir, I think, because it's not a film where they, because uh, because Thompson wanted to make the film because I, my understanding was he was very much opposed to capital punishment. But the challenge of the story was, she's guilty. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not like an innocent person is being tried. I mean, she tells her story, you know, in flashbacks about why she committed a cold blooded murder which is how the film starts. And it's a fantastic scene in, at the beginning of the film where she commits the murder. And uh, I just find that that's what makes it so noir to me is that they're not, ask, they're not saying this is a fluke. This is not a Cornell Woolrich story where the guy's wrongly accused or something and he's gonna be executed. She's guilty, uh, but, that, but they still hang in there and, and you end up empathizing with her completely. Um, and just, you know, for the sake of completeness, there was eventually a film, Mike Newell made a film about yep. the actual Ruth Ellis case, uh, called Dance with a Stranger with yep. Miranda Richardson. And, and that's a really good movie as well. So, uh, anyway, so yep. good one, Ron, uh, yield to the night. Uh, let's hope it makes it on, uh, Noir Alley in the second half of 2024. Yeah, and Diana Doors did like a, a lot of interesting films sort of later in life, just, um, and there was one especially, and I, I cannot remember the name of it, all I remember is that Burt Kwok was also in it, about this guy working like at a, at a 
sort of like a pool bathhouse thing and she's this older woman and she only has one scene but it's hilarious where she's you know getting on with this guy and she's so funny and it's just the way she she does it and it was just and it was just like one of those completely fearless performances you know what i mean yeah yeah where yeah, yeah. She, she just did the character and it was great and you know you could i couldn't see a lot of like former hollywood starlets having done that that yeah. scene you know it was really cool and of course she is the fairy godmother in the prince charming video at a man's studio yeah wow okay and you know she and she did um Oh my God! What was the film she did? She did another picture with Jay Lee Thompson before this. I think it's called "The Weak and the Wicked," that uh, Joan Henry also wrote. So, so there was a little thing going on there uh, with that that triumvirate of talents making these movies. And and I totally agree with you. I think she is completely overlooked and underrated as an actress because. It's just when when you have a figure like that and you're a platinum blonde, you're nobody thinks you can do anything but be sexy, and that's it, you know. Yeah. But um, you know, noir noir fans probably know the Long Haul, the movie that she made with Victor Mature, uh, that Ken Hughes did. It really really good film, uh, which we showed at uh, Noir City yeah. a few years ago as part of the international festival, and. Um, and Victor Mature was really good in that movie. And, and she was, you know, that was her at her most, uh, you know, voluptuous, sexy Diana Doors. But it's still, it's a really good performance. She's terrific in it. Anyway, uh, yeah. okay, moving on. Tom from Sebring, Florida. I wonder if he knows Ron in Jupiter, Florida. Um, uh, Tom says, I discovered director Christian Petzold through your article in the Noir City Annual 2021. You have Imogen Sarah Smith to thank for that. She wrote that great article. I've seen and enjoyed only three of his films so far. Barbara to, from 2000, Phoenix 2014, and Transit in 2018, and uh, of which I feel Phoenix is special and the other two are very good. Uh, what are your favorite two or three Pets Old films? Uh, and he, and he talks about a few other uh, things that he wants to see in there. Uh, and he thanks us for including that article in the North City Magazine. Well, thank Imogen, the, now the editor-in-chief of the magazine. And uh, that's exactly why she's now the editor-in-chief of the magazine. She, How do you get the magazine, Eddie? Oh, you sign up for uh, the Film Noir Foundation mailing list is step one. And then step two is to donate uh, at least 20 bucks to the foundation. And once we have your email address and confirmation of a donation, you will get that digital magazine delivered directly to your inbox whenever we produce one, <laughs> which, which is supposed to be four times a year, but it's usually more like three. Uh, I don't know what you call it. I mean, a quarterly is a quarterly. I don't know what you call something that comes out three times a year, but, um, you know, it just depends on when your uh, filmic year starts, like your fiscal year. We'll call it your filmic year, whenever that starts. Sometimes we sneak in four, but if it, we're going by the calendar year, not always. But the new one is out now. Yes, it I is. Mean, it's out now. It it just came out yesterday or whatever. And it's, you know, what can I say? It's fantastic. Um, so, okay. but back, back to Tom's question. Um, well, I, uh, I I think the first uh, Pet Sold film that I saw was Jericho, uh, which uh, I guess was like 2008 or something. And it and it is I liked it very very much, and uh, it was sort of a unofficial reworking of The Postman Always Rings Twice. And I love those stories when they're set in other countries because it it's just so telling to see a story that simple and with emotions that universal, then the cultural differences really stand out. And so that that was really fun. And, and I agree uh, with you, Tom, that Phoenix is, is, is his, I would say is probably his best movie. Uh, but I thought Transit was pretty great too. Now, uh, and, and he, 
any opinions on these films, Anne? I've only seen Jericho, which I really, really, really liked. Yeah, um, I think Tad and I watched that together, actually. And when you were talking about like the cultural differences, it was also really good because it showed you a lot of the prejudice towards Turkish people that there is in Germany. And um, which was kind of cool because that really corresponded well within the original story with him being Greek. Yeah, 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 you know? yeah. And I, I thought that that was cool to, to, to see that part of it still really, really in there. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, well, we're gonna, you're going to be seeing a lot of that in the Noir City Festival this year. <laughs> that, that ends up being like a, a constant theme uh in the film is like in cultures there's always the outliers in in whatever culture it is you know and they tend to have the most noirish stories um but uh, yeah i think that i mean i know that imogen is, is far more well versed in uh, christian petzold's films than i am and i i i'm not speaking for her but i i have heard her say that she thinks you know he's one of the best filmmakers working today anywhere in the world so uh all of those films come highly recommended transit was a really good film too because it's uh you know, there's a lot of noir themes running around in that with the questions of identity and trying to get safe passage and all that. And uh, very, very interesting movie. I, I didn't like it quite as much as those other two. And I and I am obviously, uh, you know, eager to see, to, to fill in because I haven't seen everything that, that he's done. So I'm I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is from Gary in Brooklyn. Uh, two quick questions. I'm interested in learning more about the Hollywood blacklist. Are there any books or documentaries you could recommend on the subject? <laughs> I'm a big fan of the 1951 B movie, The Hoodlum, starring Lawrence Tierney, as well as Lawrence Tierney, as as Lawrence Tierney, basically. Any chance of seeing this restored on Blu-ray? Uh, okay. Number one, you're in luck. Uh, yes, uh, The Hoodlum will be coming out on Blu-ray. Uh, I'm trying to remember who's put I think Film Detective is putting it out, and they are using uh, the UCLA Film and Television Archives restoration of the film, um, which was done many years ago. <clears throat> just, just as an interesting footnote, um, The Hoodlum when it was released was the B film that played with the Prowler. Wow. Right? What a double so, uh, feature. Yeah. The Prowler and the hoodlum. That was the double bill. Right. And, and one was an A-list picture with stars and the other one was Lawrence Tierney, you know, already having essentially killed his career with his antisocial behavior. He, he uh, th this was about it. You know, this was all he could, muster at that point but it, it, i mean the role is just tailor-made for him he, he's just a complete uh sociopath who spends the entire movie wondering wh why people think he's a bad guy <laughs> it, it is in some in some respects it's the definitive lawrence tierney performance man it's a cheap movie it is an incredibly cheap movie and i remember asking tierney about the film and uh, he he hated uh, Max Nosick, who directed the movie, who also directed his breakout picture, Dillinger, was also Max Nosick. And I'm not going to repeat what he said, but it was as only as only Lawrence Tierney can do it. He when I said, what about Max Nosick? And, and he just let go with the stream of the foulest invective I could, maybe that I had ever heard. And uh, it was like, wow, okay, that's the guy who gave you your breakout role. So I'm glad if that's what you think of him, I'm not going to get on your bad side, dude. So, and as for learning more about the blacklist, wow, wow. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, I don't, uh, I have over here, I'm reaching over because I have an entire 
stack of books here, uh, like a dozen books on the blacklist right here, not to mention there's many more all over the place, but just, just for starters here, let's do this. I'm going to recommend this book, Black Sunset by Casey Siegel, right? Uh, let's see if I can get that there out here. Uh, Hollywood, Sex, Lies, Glamour, Betrayal, and Raging Egos uh, by Clancy, Clancy Siegel. This book is, is terrific. Uh, it, it's more of a, a memoir kind of thing than it, than it is a history lesson or something. And, and I, will, I voted for this uh, when I got to vote for the 100 greatest film books of all time. I voted for this as one of my favorite uh, memoirs, Hollywood memoirs. Then you get stuff like this, just the, the old like reports, government reports on blacklisting and the business. Then let's see what else we got. We got Hollywood Red, the St Lester Cole's autobiography. There's that one. Uh, anyway, there's a whole ton of books over here. So, you know, if, if you want to read about that, uh, Victor Navasky is an author to look for. Naming Names is a great book. Uh, Tender Comrades is a great book about the blacklist. And any of those, most of the, the Hollywood 10 wrote their own memoirs of the blacklist. The Ring Lardner Jr. and, uh, you know, Paul Jericho and these guys. Uh, Interesting. And and I will say, I'm just going to throw this out there. I don't want to jump the gun on this, but uh, I am in the process right now of producing a documentary specifically about Abraham Polanski, who was uh, blacklisted. He, of course, is the writer of Body and Soul, the writer, director of Force of Evil, uh, screenwriter of Odds Against Tomorrow. And ha he has, just has a really, really fascinating story. And uh, I'm doing a documentary on him that I'm hoping will be done in 2024. And, uh, you know, that will be available. And um, I'm, I've gotten some really tremendous people to participate in it. Uh, some pretty, pretty big names have contributed their interviews to it. And I'm, I'm very excited about it. So uh, if, if you can, uh, if you can wait, Gary, um, you'll learn a lot just from that one. <laughs> Who was the blacklisted writer? He went to Mexico and he actually worked on a film with Bunuel. Um, well, a great many of these writers did go to Mexico. I mean, yeah. Trumbo, of course, lived in Mexico for years. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of who, uh, it wasn't Guy Endor, was it? No. Um, I should know this, but it's it's yeah. slipping my mind at the moment. I can't remember, but I met his wife who wrote a memoir about it, about going about their whole process of, of well, you know, for, you know it, uh, honestly, it that really that uh, that I think that was Guy Endor because Guy okay. Endor's Guy Endor's wife did write a memoir. Oh, okay, so that that's uh, really, yeah. Yeah, and 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 he was one of those guys who, for about three or four years there, they were all swapping, because like one guy would get the heat would come on them, and they they couldn't put their name on something, and then like Guy Endor would step in and say, "I'll I'll sign it," and then eventually he got blacklisted, and then somebody else had to step up and sign his work. And it and it just went on like that, like dominoes falling. Um, and it's it's fascinating because um, when I was researching my book on gun crazy, I I found a incredible box of stuff at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences that was in the King Brothers uh, special collection, which hadn't even been accessioned yet. So the Academy didn't really know what was in this box. They just knew they had the box. And I went in and said, I, I want to look at this stuff that belonged to Frank King, who produced Gun Crazy. And in the box was all of this correspondence 
with Trumbo when he was in Mexico, when he was blacklisted. He and his wife Cleo moved down to Mexico, and and I found this fabulous. And they would pay Trumbo for his work on their screenplays. They would pay him with checks written out to his wife. Uh, Cleo Fincher was her maiden name, and they wrote them so that if the mail was intercepted, they wouldn't have the name Trumbo anywhere on them. That's yeah. how much the government was after this guy, you know? And and, it, and in the uh, box was this fabulous letter that Trumbo wrote talking about wanting to write a screenplay based on the bullfights that he had just witnessed. And of course, that would become the brave one uh, that the King brothers produced. That was their, probably their highest profile movie they ever made. And, and of course, Trumbo won the Oscar and couldn't accept it because it was a, the movie was signed by a guy, by Robert Rich who didn't exist. Right. And so I, I just thought that was so fascinating to actually see these documents where the, this was the first reference to that film anywhere. And it was pretty cool. Anyway. Um, okay, so Ken from Oklahoma says, thank you for showing Decoy on TCM. It's become one of my favorites. <laughs> I can tell what your sensibility is already, Ken. Uh, my question is related to Decoy because of the famous or infamous prison breakout scene, which stretches credulity to the extreme. What, just the breakout? Not not the fact that there's a serum that can restore life to dead people? That's not extreme. <laughs> Is there another film noir that you or Anne can think of which also contains a scene that either equals or perhaps stretches credulity even more, in your opinion? Um, and he says, I'd like to know because I'm wondering if decoy is the limit. Oh, uh, what's the one with the woman scientist? Strange oh, strange impersonation. impersonation. Strange impersonation. Yeah, that that's that's pretty whack too. Yeah, I think he, yeah. I, th I think Ken would enjoy that. I yes, Ken. If you have not seen Strange Impersonation, we are strongly suggesting that. Um, that is an Anthony Mann film, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Anthony Mann film, and uh, yeah, it's it's completely berserk. Of course. The most preposterous, when you say what stretches credulity to the extreme, I'm going to suggest something that is so mundane, but has always been, to me, the most unbelievable thing in any noir film, is that nobody recognizes Richard Basehart in tension. No, shit. Because he it takes is, his glasses off. This is literally off. Superman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It just cracks me up that like nobody recognizes this guy when he takes his glasses off. And I, I you know, I don't know what that's about. I mean, there's nothing science fiction -y about it or anything. It's just like, and I, I get it that the point of the movie was that the guy is such a nobody that nobody pays attention to him anyway. You know, so the, the glasses are the only distinguishing feature about him. And when he doesn't have the glasses, they don't rec they don't realize it's the same guy. Yeah. But really, <laughs> I remember when I introduced it on TCM, I was trying to find some way to justify the insanity of this of this plot. You know, not that I think it's necessary, but I did realize that contact lenses had come out right then. Like, like they weren't a thing. So it was like a big deal that when he took the glasses off, nobody could believe it was him because he had said, I can't see without my glasses. And then there's this guy who's walking around perfectly fine because he has contact lenses, this crazy new invention called contact lenses. And it, it felt like the whole movie became like an ad for contact lenses or something. Bausch and Lomb brings you tension. That you can kill your wife. Yeah, exactly. So you can now you have a, a way to murder your wife and get away with it. Oh, and I would just say in a way, uh, or murder. Have, excuse me, murder your wife's lover. Murder your wife's lover. It. Excuse me, yeah. not your wife. You, yeah, you don't want to. You don't want to kill off Audrey Totter prematurely in a movie. Never. No, never. 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 Oh, and I was just gonna say in a way, leave her to heaven, but just because 
it's like there's so many things that happen. I mean, it's actually in some ways it, it's very believable because, you know, she's a sociopath. But just the extent she goes to with her well, jealousy. The ultimate. Yeah. The ultimate. She, yeah. she, she does the ultimate crazy person move yeah. in that film. Not to spoil it for those who haven't seen it. But, I mean, in that, that scene is where people either the the film like rockets into the stratosphere of great crazy person movies with that scene or else everybody checks out not everybody but you know people, certain people say oh i i can't believe this this is just too much you know yeah and so, she dumps vincent price and I, we know that Anne would never do that i would never do that years. only a crazy person would do that yeah there you go there you go so ken i hope uh, we've given you a few other I mean, it, it, your question also is interesting because decoy is kind of a special case because it's borderline science fiction be, because of the methylene blue and the whole idea that there's a drug that can restore life uh, once you're dead. And and as uh, as Stanley Rubin, the writer of the film, pointed out, he said, you know, it's it's based on fact because there is such a thing. Uh, and yeah, it, it's, um, what am I, what am I thinking of? There's a, there's a, a, a chemical I'm thinking of, but the, the reality is it can, it, it can't bring you back if you're dead, but it, it counteracts cyanide poisoning. That, that's what methylene blue would do. It would counteract like an antidote to cyanide poisoning which is how they killed people right in the gas with cyanide in the gas chamber so the idea was they'd use it to bring this guy back to life well but they methylene blue doesn't work if you're dead <laughs> if your heart is stopped Most and your body stop. has ceased to function it's not going to revive you but if you sw if you swallow cyanide or something and you're still living you take this drug and it will counteract it and save your life but and there's a film called the house across the bay yeah with george where, raft with george raft where he's regularly breaking out of alcatraz by swimming across across the bay well th this this of course is le is legendary of course because you know there are people that have quote unquote escaped from alcatraz that have never been found and so the legend is did they just drown or did they actually make it yeah. you know I mean, that's the whole premise of Clint Eastwood and Don Siegel, their Escape from Alcatraz movie, is based on that incident where these guys broke out and tried to swim to shore. Um, Pretty sure you die from hypothermia. I'd say there's a good chance of it. But if you hate being in prison, I bet it's a chance. I, oh, I bet it'd be worth the risk. Take. I mean, Alcatraz wasn't a great place. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but but the, the uh, Ken's sighting of decoy is interesting to me because it is kind of a science fictiony movie which makes its um the, the incredulity of it is kind of based on science so you can throw it out because it's like it's it goes contrary to to the laws of science and and laws of reality as we know it you know so you know something like if you think invasion of the body snatchers is a film noir it's also like completely ridiculous because it's science fiction there are not pod people growing in you know back in the hothouse you know but um so it is one way of distinguishing what is a film noir you know is it noir or not well it depends on like what makes you think this is preposterous right uh if it's science fictiony kind of preposterousness because in some ways like the end of kiss me deadly is preposterous because uh -huh. merely opening a strong box of uranium or plutonium or whatever the hell it is is not going to cause the house to explode you know but they they wanted a big ending you know i mean it's it's clearly going to infect you and you are eventually going to die but it's not going to cause the house to blow up so that's kind of absurd but we we give that a pass because you got to have a big ending. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And night has a thousand eyes. Night has a thousand eyes. Well, that's a whole other, 
boy, now you had to go and open up that can of worms, and talking about <laughs> credulity stretching plots, you had to bring up Cornell Woolrich. Yeah. yeah. Then you talk then you start well, talking about right. <laughs> then you start talking about the chase, right, from nineteen forty six, uh, which is like, what the hell is happening in this movie? Uh yeah. So perhaps better to leave yeah, some things. Let's oh. not go down the Woolrich rabbit okay. hole. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, this is uh, this is uh, number this seven. Is number seven. This is Joe on Long, Long Island. We know of Eddie's love for Chinatown, but having just watched the two Jakes, I was wondering about his take on the sequel, written by Town, but under a pretty lackluster direction by the star by the star some sixteen years later. It's not as good as Chinatown, <laughs> yeah. But I don't think it's as bad as people think it is. It's it's not Chinatown. I mean, I, I honestly I can't think of a of a film more difficult to follow up than Chinatown because it, it's damn near perfect, right? So whatever you do, and I I sincerely admire Robert Town's ambition with what was to be a trilogy of films about the history of Southern California. And it was it was uh, water, uh, then oil and the building boom. That was the two Jakes. And then the third one was going to be the development of the highway system. Uh, and, and Jake would be involved in all of these. There would be through lines to the mystery. And of course, he would get older and age as all these various uh, tales of civic corruption and how Los Angeles was built uh, play out over the decades. And, and, you know, that, that didn't come to pass, unfortunately, I would, I would love to see somebody should publish all of town's screenplays in one collection, because he did write them all. Yeah, right. He even wrote, uh, to my understanding, he wrote the third one. But it was like, yeah, you know, after the experience of the two Jakes, it was like, we're not going there again. But I don't think that film is as bad as people think it is. But, yeah, I mean, I um, saw it when it came out. It was good. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't Chinatown, but I thought it was a good movie. Yeah, I mean, it. Chinatown is so perfect. Like, like all the bit players are completely... Uh, fleshed out and realized almost instantaneously in Chinatown, which is is not easy to do, and that doesn't happen in the two Jakes. Yeah, I mean, I think Harvey Keitel is pretty interesting as Jake Berman in that film, and that was that was the part that was the bone of contention in the whole thing because when everybody was riding high and and forgive me if people already know this story but when everybody was riding high with the success of chinatown and town said you know i've got a follow-up they were so enthusiastic that it nicholson had kind of promised robert evans that he would play the jake berman character in the two jakes it would be like his return to acting since you know he he started as an actor, and and then at a certain point Robert Tenton said that's just not going to happen, you know Evans just isn't an act enough of an actor to do this, yeah. and and then it all that's when everything started falling apart, and and that's when Nicholson had to take over as the director of the film just to get the damn thing done. And, and, you know, Jack Nicholson is not Roman Polanski as a, as a director. So he's good. He knows what's good and he's talented. But he doesn't have that natural instinct for how to tell a story that Polanski had. So, um, you know, that that's... Um, I'm, it doesn't even work to show those two movies as a double bill. Because because time has to pass between seeing them because all you'll think watching the two Jakes is this is not as good as Chinatown. <laughs> yeah, you have to see it years after. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that's my take on that. Okay, Christoph, Christoph, uh, 
I I like this question. Christoph says, I, I recently watched the movie Murder My Sweet, and I thought the dialogue and plot was superior to The Big Sleep. Are there any other Philip Marlowe films or similar detective-led films that you would recommend? Sounds to me like Christoph is kind of a kind of new to the genre. I, I hope I'm not misinterpreting that, but um, that's great. And I love the fact that he is not, um, you know, thinks for himself. Yeah. Uh, because in many ways, I, I think Murder My Sweet is arguably the more noir of those two films. Uh, and that's just because of the way um, Edward Dimitrik directs the film as opposed to the way Howard Hawks directs The Big Sleep. Um, and Claire Trevor. But, exactly. And Claire Trevor is in it. You know, no, no offense to, uh, to Lauren Bacall or, you know, Martha Vickers or anybody, but uh, Claire Trevor is, is she, she's, uh what's her uh what's her great line in that i um i've never killed a man that i've known uh known for so little and liked so much or something <laughs> a, she's and she's really great at those lines uh but what is so the other philip marlowe films yeah. i mean clearly there's the big sleep there's uh you know Murder My Sweet, which is based on Farewell My Lovely. There's the Brasher Doubloon with uh, George Montgomery playing Marlowe. Not a good choice for Marlowe, but an, an interesting film. That's the most that's the most uh, German expressionist version of a Philip Marlowe story. It makes Los Angeles look like Weimar Berlin. Um, there's The Lady in the Lake, which... Uh, to for me is like for completists only I'm not a huge fan of that movie because i think it's a mistake to have the subjective camera thing uh the little sister which was turned into a very 1960s version of marlo played by james garner uh, with, the bruce movie's called, with bruce, bruce lee, lee in and it. he has a scene yeah. yeah he does he he trashes marlo's office and um yeah, that and it's just called Marlowe. And um, obviously there's The Long Goodbye uh, and the Elliot Gould version of that. The Altman film is, is you know, the controversial revisionist take on that. And um, Even though I, I really like it, and this, what's really strange is that's like the only Robert Altman film that I really like. <laughs> I don't yeah. really like Robert Altman that much, but I really really like it like because it was one of those things when you're watching it and you're going you know this shouldn't work but this is really great it's interesting the um <laughs> this is i i already pulled this stunt on on our viewers once before uh, uh but the other night i went i went to in san francisco i went to see a screening of fallen leaves uh aki kurismaki's latest film and the stars of the film were there. Uh, Alma Poisti, who I had met previously in Mexico, but her co-star, uh, UC Vanatin, was there. And we were talking, and it, it was, I, I don't know if people have seen the movie. I highly recommend the movie. It's a, it's a lovely film. Have you seen it yet? No, I have not. Okay, you, you make sure you see it. It's right. a really, really beautiful film very simple filmmaking like that's kind of kurismaki's thing and uh, it's not noir it's not noir in any way shape or form it's it's the most downbeat romantic comedy you will ever see and uh, it takes place in in finland and it's quiet it's a very quiet movie uh but i was talking to you afterwards and uh i said it, it, have you been in California for long? He said, oh, I just came from LA. And I said, oh, did you have fun? And he says, yeah, I went to the new Beverly cinema, which is Quentin Tarantino's uh, movie theater there. And he said, and I saw one of my favorite movies, the long goodbye. I got to see it in theater in LA. And I said, ah, oh, that's, that's great. And I, and I pulled out, you know, the, uh, the little harmonica. Did, have you seen this? No. I haven't, I haven't shown you, you this. You've never shown this to me. 
Okay, this is this is kind of funny because um, Elliot Gould gave me this harmonica uh, when we were on the TCM cruise together because this is the harmonica that Marlo plays in The Long Goodbye. He he at the end of the film, and if people who are watching stop watching right now because I'm going to give away the end of the movie. Well, I'll be I'll be subtle about it. At the end of the film, Marlowe does something that's very shocking and out of character for Philip Marlowe. And as he walks away at the end, he encounters the femme fatale, who's been through the whole movie. And his last gesture is to take out this harmonica that he's had through the whole movie. And he <laughs> plays some little thing. And then that segues into... Hooray for Hollywood, which is the closing music on the film. And anyway, it was it was very funny because I had I had asked Elliot Gould about the music in the film, which is tremendous because the soundtrack to The Long Goodbye is so complicated and wonderful because uh, John Williams wrote this tune, The Long Goodbye, that's the theme of the movie, but Altman uses it everywhere in the film. It's, it's recreated as Muzak in the supermarket. It's on the car radio. It's on a jukebox in a, in a bar. You know, it just keeps coming back throughout the film. And so I commented on this to Elliot Gould, which is what prompted him to explain that at the end of the film, when he's carrying this harmonica around, Altman had kind of suggested that maybe we can reprise the the long goodbye theme on the harmonica and Elliot Gould was like, yeah, you know, that ain't going to happen. But, <laughs> but, you know, he played this thing and I, it was so touching because as we came off stage, I said, cause it was really fun. It was a really fun interview and he was great. And, and I said, uh, boy, that was, that was terrific. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. And he turned around and he just took the harmonica on this little, you know, chord that he's had it on. And he just handed it to me and said, I think, I think this belongs with you. Oh my God. <laughs> and he gave me the harmonica and uh, it, it was, it was great. And so that obviously I was very touched because I'm wearing it. You know, I wear the it around my neck all the time now. So I have, I have Philip Marlowe's harmonica from the long goodbye. Wow. That's pretty cool. That's that pretty cool. extremely cool. Yeah. You, you see was, uh, was suitably, uh, impressed by that, he he made me pose for a picture with the harmonica so he could send it to his friend <laughs> in L.A. Okay, so um, Anne, you're reading the next one because and it, you've done it again. You've you've managed to to abut questions that have something in common. So yes, that's my specialty. <laughs> uh, and this is Ruth from uh, Lago Vista, Texas. I no, know you, you skipped one. You skipped. One. Oh wait, wait. No, you're right. Nine. Sorry, this is Tommy, Tommy Roblevsky. Tommy Roblevsky in, from in London. London. Uh, you had a question about Raymond Chandler's short stories being done on TV. May twenty fifth, twenty twenty three episode. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, that was our episode. Okay. Yeah, that was our episode. By the way, uh, right now we're in the questions from July. Just to let people know, we will get to your question eventually. May 25th, Tuesday. Wow, okay. We're, yeah. That was a while ago. Right, but then he submitted this question in July 2023. So the questions from Ju his questions Underst from July. I understand, I okay. understand. Somehow it seemingly got missed. An accidental, uh, uh, an accidental omission, uh, wait, blah, blah, blah. Uh, an accidental emo omission, if I, I'm sure, unless I miss, missed, misunderstood something. The best rendition is surely the following. Philip Marlowe, Private Eye from Chandler's Short Stories, the first independent HBO production. So well played by Powers Booth with a great supporting cast. Personally, I think it's a terrific series. Booth is, very, is a very fine Marlowe. How do you, how do you, Eddie and Ann, feel about it? Have you seen it? I have not seen it. it I, I haven't seen all of the episodes, but the ones I've seen, I've enjoyed immensely. And I think Powers Booth is a, is a really good Philip Marlowe. Um, I mean, he, he, I mean, Powers Booth was a very interesting actor. He did a lot of really good stuff and probably should have been 
done more. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. I don't know if he was going to ever be a bigger star than he was, but uh, I just wish he had done more. You know, he kind of reminds me a little bit of uh, – he doesn't have quite the charisma of a Ray Liotta, but he's kind of that kind of intense actor, you know. They they could play a lot of the same parts, but Ray, Ray Liotta had some kind of weird, like – crazy ass charisma uh, when when he would play bad guys i mean nobody was better at you know at bad guys than ray leona uh but yeah the series is is really good and i i believe you can get it like in a collected set or something um and i i do uh highly recommend it the other the other guy that nobody talks about a lot that did marlo was james Kahn. James Conn did him in a TV thing, the Poodle Springs story, which which was not a Chandler. It was Philip Marlowe, but it was a Robert B. Parker continuing the Raymond Chandler thing, which is happening, as we've discussed, is happening again. John Banville wrote one uh, as Benjamin Black and uh, and now Denise Mina is is continuing the philip marlowe series uh in her own unique way and i i actually find denise mina's uh her marlowe book to be the best of the ones not written by chandler yeah so with powers booth did you see because i still remember watching this when i was a kid because it was one of those two night miniseries on um tv but when he played jim jones oh yeah god yeah. that was he was a jonestown the guiana tragedy yeah 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 he was that that's what i say i mean he was such an intense actor he was he was amazing as jim jones uncomfortable like yeah. i i i almost couldn't watch that because you know i lived through that yeah i mean i i was in san francisco and and knew about the people's temple and jim jones before all that happened it was like watching a car accident you know or or worse it was like watching a plane crash or something and not being able to about it because you know if you were following local politics you said what's up with this dude man he's got way too much juice at city hall for for his crackpot shenanigans and you know that was a that was that time in San Francisco, boy, between Jonestown and the murders of uh, Harvey Milk and, uh, you know, George Moscone and the whole Dan White fiasco. Jesus, we we had some crazy, crazy stuff go on in San Francisco. Anyway, that's San Francisco. That's not Philip Marlowe territory. That's L.A. They have their own crazy shit down there. <laughs> Marlo has his own crazy stuff to deal with. That's right. Okay, so now I'm going to I'm going to read the last question here from from Ruth in Lago Vista, Texas. She says, "I know you've answered questions about noir westerns in the past, but I'm not sure there is a definitive answer to the query noir or not. I I've just finished reading a treatise entitled The Noir Western." The author discusses 21 films sorted by director, which he classifies as noir westerns. He further lists another 50 films he labels noir-ish westerns. I guess my confusion comes from not knowing if there can be a proliferation of genres with noir as the defining adjective. <laughs> this seems to be the eternal question. I know. We, right? <laughs> Can there be noir comedy, noir musical, noir romance, fantasy, sci-fi, horror, historical? Uh, or does noir film find itself diminished by the appropriation of noir to define a film in another genre, i.e. Western? Or must a noir film simply have a preponderance of the qualities of noir, including an urban setting and contemporary of its time? Blah blah blah. Uh, what do you think? I didn't. Excuse me, Ruth. I didn't mean to be rude by saying blah 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 there, uh, but um, I, I I get exactly where you're coming from, and um, you know the the way that there's only in my mind one way to to deal with this, right? You're you're talking about noir, film noir, as an artistic movement 
of its time, of its mid 20th century time. And if that is how you define it, and that's what you're comfortable with, and that's what you want noir to be, then I would say you are talking about predominantly crime movies, but you would be sorely mistaken to not think that the innovations in, if you want to call them that, in style that the movement brought didn't seep over into other genres as well. So there's, and probably Westerns are the main one. And the reason for that is because of the preponderance of lawlessness in the Old West lent itself to stories that were about crimes being committed, you know, uh, the hostage stuff and holdups and, you know, robbing the, the bank and, the, and Dodge City and all this kind of stuff. Those are the same plots that you get in contemporary urban noir. Yeah. So, and yeah. Think, and I was going to say, too, I mean, one of the reasons why I love No Name on the Bullet with Audie Murphy so much was that his character is he's a, basically like a hired gun who comes into different towns and baits the person into a gunfight so he can kill them and you know not be caught but his background was that he was in the civil war and that everybody he had served with had, had died which is basically like a world war ii story and yeah. also is what happened to Audie murphy right. <laughs> in real life as well so I think sometimes being able to have like post-Civil War characters is another reason why that crosses over really well with, with film noir. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And and then you see things like, yeah, no, uh, we've discussed noir comedies. And that's that's simply taking the same premise you would find in any noir film and playing it playing it off for laughs instead of you know, like the good humor man or unfaithfully yours or, you know, having wonderful crime or movies like that. Yeah, they're funny, but it's the same basic setup. I mean, I'm I'm the guy who argues that The Big Sleep is more of a screwball comedy than it is a film noir. Mm -hmm. It just has all the window dressing of film noir. But at heart, it really is kind of a screwball comedy. Nobody is really in danger. And Howard Hawks is not the kind of filmmaker who's saying dreadful things about you know uh our society and corruption and all this that's that you know he's howard hawks is never going to be confused with abraham polanski so you, you know and we, we already mentioned invasion of the body snatchers is like a sci-fi noir there's also like a period film would be reign of terror anthony mann's uh depiction of the french revolution is a noir gangster story all of these things are part of the original noir movement and those stories would not have been told in the same way if removed from that period of time right if reign of terror was made 20 years later nobody would really be calling it a, a film noir i mean it's because it looks just like that so now i think people sometimes refer to to there, there's no question that noir has been misused, but I do think the definition is somewhat elastic, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. But sometimes, you know, I hear from people and they're like, well, somebody, I'm jumping the gun on this because I saw somebody send in a question just recently. <laughs> is Oppenheimer a film noir? And it's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. It, and, and But it's funny because you can, it leads to interesting debates because it's like, oh, it's a crime movie. Is not the development of the atomic bomb the crime of the century? I mean, you could argue that. Somebody would, would argue that, right? And, uh, and the whole thing with the hearings is very much like the blacklist, which was such a common thing that was yeah. going on there but 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 clearly i'm yeah. i i need to respect the filmmakers intentions and things and I, I even though christopher nolan is a huge proponent of film noir and understands it better than most contemporary directors i don't think he ever felt he was making anything remotely like a film noir no it's a biopic it's a, it's it's a really a, really it's, great it's a, biopic it's a historical biopic about yeah. about arguably the major event of the 20th century 
the creation of the ultimate weapon. That that's what that movie is about. I I think it trivializes the movie to to say, yeah, but is it a film noir? You know, um, it's not. And and for anybody who wants to ask it, Barbie is not a film noir. <laughs> Even though Ken could go bad, Ken yeah. clearly could go bad. But, you know, if somebody wanted to make Barbie as a film noir, I think there's ample opportunity there for plots. Oh, right? Absolutely. Somebody's plotting somebody's murder in, in Barbie land, you know. Yeah. Uh, I'd pay fun. to see it. I'd pay yeah. to see it. Yeah. They should do absolutely. it in the sequel. Barbie noir. I, I hope I get a cut of this when somebody <laughs> comes up with this on on the internet because I, I can sense that it's going to get some traction. This idea yeah. is going to get some traction. But it and has I'm just, been, go ahead. I was going to say, it has been also funny to see too, like how many times now there'll be a TV series and they'll do like a, a noir episode, like in uh, the midnight club on Netflix, which is produced by Mike Flanagan. Um, it, they get together eat they they get together at midnight and each kid tells a story and one of them tells a film noir it is just so it's like one of my favorite episodes because it's just like because they all sort of cast each other so things about their own lives sort of get caught up in their story so it's kind of interesting to see this particular it, it, character it's a, it's a time on, it is a time honored tradition if you go back re- remember uh it was a big deal when moonlighting was on tv oh yeah that uh, they did a film noir episode of Moonlighting. Uh, there was a film noir episode, I think, of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, there was what was that series? Dirty Pretty Things or Pretty Little Things or something? Pretty Little Liars? Uh, no, it, God, I'm embarrassed. And the guy, the guy who who wrote and directed it is a is a belongs to the Film Noir Foundation. Joe <laughs> Joe Doherty. and I now I can't remember the name of the series, but he he definitely had a film noir episode in that series and it, it yeah it, it crops up a lot yeah. you know and because every that's the deal man everybody loves the style and that's generally what they're doing when they they co-opt the noir is they want to do it in black and white and they want to do it with the shadows and the whole thing so yeah. and and i just want to uh with like two minutes to go here okay. uh i i want to just throw something out because it occurred to me the other day I was watching because apropos of this question, which is something that we've dealt with several times. um, People ask, can it be a noir if it has a happy ending? And I think people use the term happy ending kind of cavalierly. It doesn't necessarily need to be a happy ending or an uplifting ending. It's just not the most tragic option as an ending, right? So a lot of stories, you don't you don't get the face down in the gutter ending, you get walk off and live to see another day. And people yeah. sometimes will say, that's a happy ending. Is it really noir? Well, I, I have been watching uh, this series of TV movies made in France based on uh, Georges Simenon novels, right? Now, I'm a, I'm a huge sucker for the Maigret series, all, uh, you know, produced in France with Bruno Cremer as, the, as playing Maigret. And I love those. But this series is, is all based on Simenon stories that aren't detective stories. They're his noir stories. And it was fascinating to watch a couple of these that didn't have the tragic ending. And that's, and they are faithful to Simenon's stories. And they are totally noir. It is, it, I, and they convinced me that it is not necessary to have the most tragic possible ending in order to be noir. It's just at a certain point, Simenon was like, I've told the story, you get the point. This is totally miserable. But I'm not going to kill this guy. He's just going to continue living his life, and he's going to be haunted by this, by all the stuff that happened, and that, and that's it, you know. So I mean, but then again, George Simenon wrote so many stories that I just think at a certain point it became a choice on his part to say, yeah, they're going to die in this one. 
nope, they're going to live in this one. You know, it, he didn't he didn't have a formula for it. But boy, those stories are as it's all the noir you could ask for. Yeah. And and they're really really good. There one in particular I'm thinking of is based on a story he wrote called uh, The Black Ball, uh, which is about a guy who his entire life revolves around being accepted into this social club in Paris. And he is, it's actually outside Paris. Uh, and although his life is perfectly fine, otherwise he, he loses his mind because he believes somebody in this club is blackballing him literally by putting, yeah. when they vote on his membership, he, they're putting the black ball in the thing and, and it drives him crazy. And uh, it's it's all the noir you could want, <laughs> and it, and it also is very much like you were talking about with the uh, Jericho. Uh, it's it's about uh, an immigrant family in France, and he he becomes obsessed with that's why he's getting the black ball is they won't they'll never accept me because I'm from Portugal I'm not from France. And even though he fits into the community in every other way, there's somebody who won't completely accept him and it and it drives him to murder or not. You got to watch it to find out or read the book. And I was going to say just one thing about happy endings too. I think sometimes like it's also, it depends who gets a happy ending. Cause like in pitfall te technically that's a happy ending, right? I mean, that's a that's a great example. You know, that is a great example, and uh, because you know there are people I know who don't like Pitfall because it doesn't have that knife twist ending. Look that, what they, that, to that, her. That, of course, of course, that's what they that's what some people how they react. Or, and this is very common amongst, or more common amongst male viewers they think that he's being punished at the end because he has to go back to his wife, right? Who's the only sensible character in the whole movie, right? Yes. So I, I just don't get that. I mean, it's clearly Mona Stevens, the Liz Scott character who's getting, who's the real noir character yeah. in the, in the plot. And she's getting totally screwed at the end. And just the way De Toth deals with it, it, you know, he it's so casual. Like the brush off of her at the end is so casual. It makes me, I'd love, to, I'm sorry I never had the opportunity to ask De Toth about the ending of that film. Because I would love to have known, like, what what's the deal there? You know, did would you have preferred to spend a little more time with Scott at the end, or was that your your plan was to just dismiss her because she's a woman and nobody really gives a crap about her anyway, you know? Or maybe and, it's reflective that's what happens to her. I mean, that's what happens to the character, right? Yeah. I Dick mean, she has his little venture and then it's like, oh well, sorry, I destroyed your life. Yeah, he, he gets to go back home and re resume his life and she gets sucked into the bowels of the prison system, you know? It's like, wow, that was rough. And, and she doesn't even get a, a, a goodbye or a farewell or anything, you know? You, you just see her from the back being led off to, you know, oh, geez, it's cold. Um, anyway, um okay <laughs> and i have uh i have to go <laughs> but i know it's kind of late tonight and it's i still have other stuff i gotta do so um as you can see i'm dressed to go out so yes. uh i am yes i i will be uh doing that shortly so um again i thank everybody uh for tuning in uh i think we've covered all the Subscription to the magazine. The the Noir City Festival starts tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah. If uh, if you are attending, uh, I'll see you there yeah. in person at the Grand Lake Theater in Oakland, California. It's very. We will have very, some. Uh, very excited. Yeah, I know it's going to be great. I'm, uh, it has been a real um, uphill struggle putting this year's festival together. Uh, uh, but it, it will be great. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it. I know we have, uh, 
I'm I'm always tortured when the 49ers do well because it, it, it invariably they run up against the Noir City Festival. I'm happy that most of our um, attendees could care less about professional football. Uh, I will probably be hiding backstage with a small television <laughs> watching the games, but, you know, during the movies. But um, so I, I will we'll see how well I can hide my emotions when I come out to introduce a film. You'll The audience will know immediately whether the 49ers won or lost. <laughs> There you go. Okay, so hopefully we will see everybody in two weeks. Fantastic. The fe the first festival of the year will be in the books by then, and we'll be gearing up for Seattle. So yeah, um, and I can't wait to see you in person. Yeah, and uh, everybody, I hope we see you there as well, and uh, either in Oakland or somewhere down the road in 2024. Keep yeah. the questions coming. We're gonna keep doing this. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night.